guys, thanks for tuning in as always. Now, a few weeks or so ago, uh, Ashton Town announced Glyn Hurst as their new first team manager ahead of the 2021 season. I'm pleased to say that I'm now joined live by the former Barnsley, Air United, Chesterfield and Berry striker. Good evening, Glyn. Just tell things with you, mate. And uh, obviously, it's very testing times for everyone. Yeah, evening, Tom. Uh, evening, everybody who's, who's watching. Yeah, obviously, just uh, so everybody, anybody, everybody who's watching, just, just stay safe. It's a, it's a tough time for everybody. Obviously, at the moment, there seems to be a few conflicting uh, reports, but uh, stay safe, stay indoors until, you know, I think lockdown is shut completely because uh, it's not a good time for for anybody over 30,000 deaths and, you know uh, you know it's just harrowing for those people who have lost lost uh, loved ones people have lost husbands children have lost their uh, mums and dads you know so it's a, it's a it's a really 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 tough time for us as our country so you know to try and keep that death rate down stay safe and uh, be sensible i would say so glenn a few weeks ago the announcement was made in regards to taking on the First team manager, all Ashton Town in the North West Counties First Division. So, just how did the move come about? Uh, well, uh, Mark Mark sounded uh, me out about the possibility. He floated the idea with me to see if I would be interested in joining as as uh, manager. Or and uh, so he just floated the idea. He introduced himself, and uh, it's obviously something that. I went away and I spoke with my wife about, I spoke uh, with my family about, I spoke to Neil, to Jockey Answer, my, my assistant about it. We spoke about it and then I got back to Mark and, uh, you know, accepted uh, the opportunity what he's given us. So obviously before the coronavirus pandemic killed off the previous campaign, Ashton enjoyed a decent season, which probably would have culminated in promotion. You must have been pleased with the players that you have at your disposal for next season. Absolutely. I mean, if you, if they were they they were six when obviously the coronavirus stopped. And mm. lo looking at the fixtures, what they had left, they had a lot of tough fixtures. I think they had Emily to play, they had AFC Liverpool to play, Low Breck to play. So they had a they had quite a tough run, and so that would have been interesting to see how that would have uh, panned out because they were ten points off. Uh, the places what were needed to uh, get promoted. So as as far as I'm concerned, where I'm coming from, uh, delighted to be inheriting a squad what is finished in the top half of the table. Uh, but for me, that's only a start as well, Tom. It's only a start for mm -hmm. so it's only for the players as well. You know, end of the day, I always I'm I'm a big 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 believer that nobody ever remembers people who finish second. In this case, in the team scenario. It's those teams what finish obviously in the top four places are the ones what everybody will remember. So uh, the the challenge for everybody and the challenge for us all is to uh, change that six into four, third, second, and first. Now, how we do that? That's up to us. That's the challenge ahead for all of us. And uh, I'm just glad that we've got a strong backbone with which to start. Yeah, what's, so what's your standpoint on obviously all the non-league sort of got scrapped every every um, from the national league down? Um, the season has just got scrapped. Would, would you would you say that's a sort of a waste of the season for the players and the and the managers? It's frustrating for all the managers and players involved, really, isn't it? It is. It's it's difficult because each each league's uh, different. I think the higher you go up, there's uh, there's bigger considerations regarding finances. But for instance, if you take our own league. You know, Lower Breck, they, they, they were the best team in the division. You know, they, they deservedly were top of the league. They, they were going to go up. They were going to get promoted. So, if, if I was sat here as, and I was manager of uh, Lower Breck, for instance, I would be really, really disappointed. You know, they, des they, they, they deserved where they were. They'd played more than 75% of the season. And they, they probably, and they would argue, and rightfully so, that they, they, they deserved to go up. And the same with Vauxhall Moses in the South Division. I mean, they were promoted. They'd won promoted by rights because, obviously, they, they'd had a fabulous season. Now, for them not to, uh, for, for them to be denied promotion, you know, it's probably fundamentally wrong. But there's, at the same time, I think the arguments, what, what, what came from that were probably in the division above where the, maybe had the bottom four teams, their arguments would be, well, we, we still had 10 games to go. And we could have won seven or eight of those games in order to stay up. 
you know, for instance. So that's where the arguments, but to, to be denied promoting, uh, promotion, if I was Vauxhall and Lower Beck mm. and all the what had done, you know, wonderful work throughout the season, I, I would be really, really disappointed. And I, I, I'd be chasing the FA as well, to be fair. Just, you know, because there, there, there is some real basic fundamental questions for them mm. to answer. Even if you look higher up as well, take South Shields, for example, what, 12 points are clear at the top of the league. But the financial um, gain that they would have had, obviously going up to the, um, to the National League North, there was, there was several, obviously they, they, they've, they've invested a lot of money into the football club as well. And to see that repaid with promotion, expected really. It must have been really, I know they've, um, they're sort of threatening the FA with legal action and stuff like that going on. and. It's a sad sign for, for that particular football club. Absolutely, I mean, because they, 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 they've obviously, you know, based their 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 budget and their spending power, you know, to want to go through the leagues, and and we're achieving that this season, you know. So to deny them that right and having to spend another uh, season, you know, in the division what they are, that that will impact on their finances. They would have voted for the promotion for bigger gates next season, probably hoping to attract you know better players. You know, maybe being able to spend some more on the on the playing budget, and also attract bigger crowds as well. I mean, they get wonderful crowds anyway. But uh, you know, football, like sports, like all sports, is a, is a progression sport. You want to manage, play, coach at the highest level, and if you've done wonderful work, you, you want that to be acknowledged. You want that to be rewarded, and if it's not rewarded, then uh, obviously, you know, what's what, what's the point in everything? I think I've read a lot of things. People make really valid points about, you know, well, what's it all about then? If if we do do, do start next season and uh, then we get six months through the season, then all of a sudden something comes along, it gets null and void, and then nothing. Are we saying then nothing really matters anymore? You know, it's uh, for instance my own team with uh, with with Marine Reserves. I think West Cheshire, the West Cheshire League, need applauding for that because they've used the points per game system. Now, with that in, within our particular division, uh, you know, that was a true reflection of where everybody probably would have finished. You know, it was a fair yeah. reflection of teams. And I can't, uh, I can't say for all the divisions, but I think in, in, in the situation, in the circumstances, I think it was the, the fairest way forward. So promotions and relegations have taken place. And rightfully so, as it should. But like I say, as you as you go further up the pyramid, uh, there's there's greater consideration uh, to financial needs and also status and also potentially, you know, you know who's influencing what decisions as well regarding what clubs. I think there's a bit of that play as well. But uh, if I was the teams like South Shields and Lower Breck and Vauxhall, uh, you know what? I'd I'd be bitterly bitterly disappointed. Mm. So obviously, with the foundation set in place for next season, I mentioned before that you've you've taken over quite a strong squad. Are you looking to to add to the squad before the current campaign gets underway? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we're we're, we're also looking. Make no mistake about it, Tom. We're also looking for the best possible players to to come to Ashton Town. You know, I want the most competitive, most vibrant squad that we can get. What gives us the best chance of gain promotion? Now. Don't get me wrong, every single uh, lad what is at the club, every single player that's at the club will be given a fair and honest uh, chance to prove what they've got, to, to, to earn their way into the squad. You know, make no mistake about that yeah. and go from there. You know, those, the, those boys, and rightfully so, they've earned their opportunity to, to, to be given pre-season to show what they can do to... to stake a claim for, for the squad for next season going forward. But if we want to make those jumps, then yeah, there's going to have to be a few additions. But I'm always a big, big believer that the players you bring in have got to be the better than better than, better than than the players you've got, or so otherwise you're wasting your time. So prior to taking on the role at Ashton Glen, you of course enjoyed a successful spell at Marine um, as a reserve team coach. It was a role that you enjoyed a lot, I expect. I, I loved it, Tom. I really, really did. We we, we had a, a wonderful season, you know. And and this is the thing people uh, didn't realise about it. But uh, you know, we didn't we didn't use any of the first teamers. We used our own players. I mean, we actually started. I, I got appointed three weeks before the season started. Wow. So we we squad together from basically players who nobody else wanted. You know, everybody else was a month into 
rugby season and we we did it we had a trial game i think we had about 30 players down who who couldn't get clubs or or, or, yeah. or any kind of, any kind of division so we made the choice and then we we kept about 20 of those players on uh, we worked them hard we created a great professional environment a lot of encouragement a lot a lot of different coaching uh, techniques and motivational methods and bit by bit we got better and we got better and better and we did we didn't change those players as well Tom we stuck with them and we went from strength to strength to strength and the second half of the season we were fabulous I mean I remember playing the semi-final as well we not only got promoted we got to a final as well what still got to be played so you know for good luck to the new uh, manager whoever that is who takes over we played against uh, Paulton Vicks who were unbeaten in 16 games I think it was I think they'd scored about 70 odd games had a lot of uh, northwest ex northwest counties premier league players in in their ranks really really good team we i remember on the day we beat them 2 uh, 2 1 and it was 2 1 going on about 7 and I, I i think that day was a culmination of all the hard work what everybody had put in to 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 the season and like i said the second half of the season with with the way we coach the way we train our expectations it will be the same at ashton you know, we, we have our expectations, uh, those never change and it's up to our players to, to, to meet the challenge on a consistent basis in order to, uh, you know, consistently achieve, you know, week in, game in, game out. I think what's great as well about the North West Counties and higher above, that there are a lot of players that have, say, um, contracts have been expired from Premier League clubs and these youngsters that have obviously uh, been signed by big Big Premier League clubs, but sort of been the release. Um, but but without being given a proper opportunity, um, these players are there to find and take a Alex Curran, a lad who I know very well. He played at Colne and recently went to FC United. Um, he played for Blackburn for five or six years and never really got a chance. And then obviously being given a chance at Colne with Steve Cunningham, he really played. I think he scored 23, 23 goals a season for three, four seasons running. And just being given that one opportunity can really show how good you are as a player. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'm a big, I'm a big, big believer in that. Me, me and my coaching staff, me and me and Jockey and Lee and Massey, we will do. We will give people opportunities. You know, at, at end of the day, you know, the, we're, we're very, very open in that that aspect. And and I quite expect, I think, especially after what what uh, we're all going through at this moment and what football clubs are going through. I quite expect that there to be a lot more players than what there usually is available, you know, because clubs like further up might have uh, to financially restructure. Yeah. They might have to restructure And I think you're going to see maybe a uh, a big ripple effect all the way through football. So it might might be quite interesting for, for me personally that I think uh, a lot more players than usually what become available will start to become available. So if I could cash you back to '94, Glenn, where it all started for you, I mentioned about youngsters coming through. Obviously, you played, you started your career at Spurs as a young kid. Um, obviously, going on then to join your home club, Barnsley, as an 18-year-old. Could I just cash you back to those days? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, Tottenham was a wonderful experience. I, I, I was only ever at the time to get to the under-21 team. But uh, fortunately, uh, I went up to Barnsley for a trial and I went up to mm-hmm. Derby as well. Both one of the designers. Uh, I've, I've decided to uh, sign for my hometown club, and you know that I, I think that's where I, I get a lot of my belief from by giving youngsters a chance. You know, Danny Wilson yeah. was a brilliant man, and then the one thing, the one thing that always sticks in my mind about Danny. You know, I was a young lad; I was 18 years of age. I was in this. I was in the squad for the few years, and he just he just used to throw you in. If he thought you were good enough, that was it. It was. <laughs> it was. A, Yep, get get go and show us what you. And and you know what it uh, he did that all the way throughout his uh, managerial uh, c- c- career. Maybe went towards the back end of his managerial career. Probably went away from that. Maybe that's why he didn't have as much success. But uh, you know, I've got a lot to thank him for because he gave me my league debut and he believed in me. Even so, sometimes when as a young lad you don't believe in yourself, sometimes. Yeah. And then obviously after Barnsley, you went on to Emley, um, a slightly different approach. And then obviously tr- you were trying to force your way through a door, get regular football week in, week out. And then you went to where United were absolutely clicked for you. You scored 
loads of goals, um, a great rate, uh, goals to game ratio. You must have really enjoyed your time up in Scotland. I, I, I did. It was, I, I really, really did. And, and the thing what people don't realise as well, Tom, we, we had a brilliant team in the first mm. season and the third season. Uh, the team, the, the, the teams, what we had, they, they, they were fabulous, really, really good teams to play in. And as, as a forward in particular, when you're playing good teams, it, uh, it makes your life a lot easier. You know, when you're playing in struggling teams as a forward, it can be, uh, it can be a bit of a grind. But a brilliant club with, uh, you know, brilliant people. I was fortunate enough that, uh, you know, played in two really good teams up there. And, uh, you know, it was uh, obviously that's where the, the, the goal record comes from. But we, we were very, very good. I mean, I remember, I think the first pre-season when I was up there, I mean, Chesterfield, I think, ended up winning League Two down here by about 15 mm. points under Nicky and I remember beating them 7-1, I think it was, at, at Somerset Park. We, wow. we were, were particularly, particularly a really, really strong team. I think that, that season, I think, I mean, Martin O'Neill Celtic, I think it was, they only beat us 1-0. They had Mark Viduka, Neil Lennon, they had a whole host of really, really good players. They beat us 1-0, quite fortunate to beat us 1-0. So we were talking about, I was quite fortunate to, you know, play, play, playing a good team because... At the end of the day, you're only as good as the players around you as well. Now, I mentioned, obviously, breaking into the first team and getting regular football. That must have given you a lot of confidence, um, hitting the ground running, scoring goals straight away. And the, the fans at Air absolutely adored you. What was it, 49 goals in 78 appearances? That was quite a return, if you look back on it. It was. And, uh, you know, it was just... You, you know what? I can honestly say, you know why? Because I played in good teams and, and I was yeah. enjoying my football. The, the, the manager had trusted in me, I was fit, he played me, and, and that was it. I just, as, you know, the fans took to me, I took to the fans, and, you know, they were a, a very family oriented club, which, which I loved. And even when I, I mean, I think me, me and my wife went back up there about five years ago, and she couldn't believe it. She said the reception and, you know, the weekend, <laughs> what we, but, uh, it, it's just fabulous, you know. I just have a good affinity. I remember once uh, when I was at Chesterfield, and I think I think we actually played Wigan, and it was at Saltergate, and uh, I think about hundred and about hundred Air United fans came down for the weekend. Wow! And with some laid down, and I went out, and we had a good night out, and that's just the kind of relationship what 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 we built up, and it was it's just really really good time, really good people down salt of the earth people. It was it was good times, good times. So would you say during that three-year period at Air United, would that would, would you say that was where your career finally kicked off? Uh, I would say my career probably kicked kicked off at Emily under Ronnie Glavin. You know that's 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 when I started to believe in myself, started to uh, become a player, started to you know learn about the game. Uh, more understand the game. We're playing on a Saturday where three points where it really mattered. Uh, I would say that it was at Emily where my, 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 my career actually, you know, really, I started to think, you know what, I can, I, I, I can, I, I can score some. So obviously after you left there too, and you enjoyed some lengthy spells at Chesterfield and Bury. Um, just how was it playing, back, um, obviously back playing football in England again? Did you feel after scoring all those goals for Eric gave you a newfound confidence heading in, uh, back into English football? Yeah, it did, and uh, you know, I nearly, I nearly signed for for Wigan, and I think like I think the day, the week I was meant to sign, there was a petrol sort shortage for for some reason I can't remember, right. and then Stockport came in with I think two hundred and fifty thousand, I think it was, and brought me back into the championship. But uh, in hindsight, I, I'm a bit gutted because you know, I, like with my playing style and the way I was, I would have been better off Wigan signing me because they played great, better, much better football. Would have suited my talents more. Where at Stockport we were more direct. We played four three three, more of a, as a, as a runner than anything kind of thing. So in that in high, uh, uh, would have signed for Wigan. It probably would have been more uh, productive for me to have joined Wigan. To be fair, but for whatever reason it didn't. Went to Stockport and we we, we stayed up. 
in the championship, which was great. And um, I think we, we beat Man City at Esley Park. We drew two all with them at Main Road the following season. So good, good, good memories, but didn't go as well as that I really, really wanted to, you know, when I came back. But that that was there was a variety of things. It wasn't for the lack of effort and you know, you know, get a real desire to want to do well and give myself the best opportunity. I think it came down to tactically and fitting into a team probably what didn't suit my style as well. You spent uh, many years at uh, Berry FC. It must it must be so disheartening and upsetting, obviously, what's gone on with, with Berry Football Club and, G- and Gig Lane. Absolutely. I mean, it's... It's, it's an, not just a massive injustice what, what's gone gone off at uh, Bury, but you know the the one thing what basically smacks me in the face, but nothing's really getting done about it. There's a few people. I think James, James Firth is at the MP. He's mm. he's done great. I think to to try and establish, you know, the factors, but nobody's looking into like a culmination of effects of, you know, what caused the club rise. It just seems to be. Yeah, Steve Dale's thing. He's the one. He's been as a villain, but basically, he he inherited the situation. Now, how did that situation unfold? I think people need to go back into that mm. and understand. Well, what what were the steps? What people took to enable the club to well to basically bring the club to the knees? You know, Ed, it's it, it's just. It's, it's ridiculous that a club the size of Bury, an absolutely brilliant club with brilliant people, you know, no longer really exists. It probably exists in name only. And I know, I think they've, I think Steve Dale's applied to, uh, is it the Conference North or something? And then we've got the Phoenix Club. But I think they need to get their heads together and uh, find a common way forward and, and with, with one club. Of course, otherwise, you're going, to cre- you're going to create a scenario where it's, uh, you're creating the us versus them. We're better than you. Basically, there is one club, and through through circumstances, uh, you know, people are going to fans are going to get caught in the middle, and I don't think that's fair either. I think what's frustrating a lot of Berry fans is obviously there's in football nowadays people are taking over clubs who are not interested in football. They're just interested in making money. And Steve Dale has openly said, "I didn't even know there was a football team in Berry and stuff like that." And that really does infuriate some Berry fans. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is where, obviously, you know, people view football clubs as a as a, as a business opportunity. Now, this mm. is that's why I'm suggesting earlier that you know the, the the FA in particular need to close those loopholes down. I think you know that uh, you know where the idea that people can come into football clubs as a way to make money, I don't think should be allowed. You know, for instance, if a club make five million pound a season, they should be able to spend five million pound a season. You know, and the 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 argument for me is that you know, while if you're coming into football or you want to run a football club to take money out of it, then I would argue that your motivations are not right. You yeah. you, you, you know, just to see the demise of a club, but I, you know, unfortunately, I think with the with the times what we're in. There might be a few more in that position going forward as well. You know, so we before we do call it a day, Glenn, obviously I mentioned before that um, I've been sent in a question from a mate of mine, a big Air United fan, Andy Walsh. She says, please ask Glenn which was his favourite ground he played at and why and thank him for his three years of Air United. I wish he'd stayed longer for us. His goal to game ratio was more than impressive. Uh, well, thanks for the question, Andy. I would I would say that the best ground that I've ever played at was Hamden Park. I was fortunate enough mm. that I played the house in the semi-final, which was fabulous. And I also we played against Queen's Park there. I think it was work, work when it's full, great atmosphere, great ground, and uh, really good memories from it. But I would say I would argue that's uh, that's the best ground I've played at. So the final word, Glenn, obviously on prior to next season getting underway. Is there plenty to do in terms of um, rec- player recruitment and other stuff you need to sort out? Yes, it is, and uh, basically from my from our point of view, it's about it's about being patient, being mm. patient. Let it pass. Let's get back to normality, and then let's see what we're dealing with then. Because obviously, at the moment when we're talking about player recruitment, that I would mean, probably argue that you know players have five or six people chasing them, and yeah. you know you probably. Clubs who've probably got 40, 50 players for for for, for pre-season. That's not a particular avenue that I uh, 
uh, will like to go down myself. I want to work with the players what we have. I want to see what we have, uh, identify the areas what we need to strengthen on and then go get the players to suit uh, the way we play, our style of play and who will suit Ashton Town Football Club and uh, what we'll take is, as, as the club badge says, onwards and upwards. It must be so difficult to prepare, obviously, with us not knowing uh, when pre-season is going to start or when the season is going to start or anything like that. There's uh, no clarity there yet. Obviously, we're waiting for an announcement from the government in the next couple of weeks to see where we go next. It is. I mean, I've sent uh, the boys. Have got the dates. They've got the pre-season mm. schedule. Uh, they, they, they've got the date. Uh, I gave it them. I think two two days ago. So they know they've got them all penciled in the diaries. Yeah. But obviously, you know that may change. You know that's all sorted. I'm I'm a very organised person, very efficient. Uh, but like I've said to the, I've said to the players that you know that may. That may change depending on the government uh, government guidelines. But when we get going, we'll we'll be methodical, we'll be patient, and uh, like I said earlier, all the players will get the opportunity. It won't be oh you get one opportunity you're out. I don't work that way. Uh, I like to I like to take my time. I like to understand my players. I like to understand how they're going to fit into the way we play uh, and into our ethos. That's really 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 important. And can the, the, the fundamental question I will ask of each and every one of my players is, can they take Ashton Town to where we want to go? So, Glenn, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you this evening. I wish you all the best for the forthcoming season. OK, cheers, Tom. Thank you.